Well, thank you for coming back to join us in Gladstream's online Bible school. Now this week we are a, in earnest, we're starting to look at a book of the Bible and we're going to read it over this coming week. And the book of the Bible uh, that we're using to kick us off in this study, and we hope you'll enjoy it, it's the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John in the New Testament, 21 chapters, so that's very easy to th Work out how many chapters you need to to read it every night. That's say uh, three three chapters a night, isn't it? Seven threes are twenty one. The school I went to anyway. So it's a good, wonderful gospel. Uh, one commentator once said, "You know the Gospel of John. It's so shallow that a toddler could paddle in it, and it's so deep." An elephant could swim in it. In other words, it's got so many levels of truth. And as a young Christian, I remember reading it for the first time. And I was blown away with the content of this gospel. And as you uh, get older in the faith and you read it again and again, you keep unearthing treasure. So I really believe you're going to enjoy this study, the Gospel of John. It's a unique gospel. There are four gospels, but John stands out as different from the others. So the video, now there's an awful lot in John, so I, it is a drop me in at the deep end. There are two Bible project videos and two Possum videos, so you're looking at a, over just over an hour and a half of video a, for our first study. So you might want to get a tea or a coffee, or you might consider watching this over a couple of sessions. Anyway, we pray that God will bless you as you embark on your study in Gladstream's online Bible school. God bless you. The Gospel According to John It's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and we learn at the end of the book that it comes from one of Jesus' closest followers called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now he appears many times in the story itself, and there's some debate about whether it's John the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve, or a different John who lived in Jerusalem and was known in the later church as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, the book embodies his eyewitness testimony, and it's been brilliantly designed with a clear purpose that he states near the end. John says, the story is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John believes that the Jesus you read about in this book is alive and real and that he can change your life forever. The book's design is really cool. Its first half opens with an introductory poem and a short story that's followed by then a big block of stories about Jesus performing miraculous signs that generate increasing controversy. And it all culminates in his greatest sign, the raising of Lazarus, which creates the greatest controversy as Israel's leaders decide to kill Jesus. And that launches into the book's second half. These chapters focus on Jesus' final night and last words to his disciples, which are followed by his arrest, trial, death, and resurrection. The book concludes with an epilogue. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half. So the book opens with a two-part introduction. First, a poem that begins, in the beginning, was the Word, an obvious allusion to Genesis 1, when God created everything with his Word. Now, a person's words, they're distinct from that person, but they're also the embodiment of that person's mind and will. And so John says that God's Word was with God, that is distinct. And yet the word was God, that is divine. And as we ponder this claim, we hear later in the poem that this divine word became human in Jesus. Then John goes on to draw from the stories of Exodus, saying that Jesus was God's tabernacle in our midst. The glorious divine presence that hovered over the Ark of the Covenant became a human in Jesus. Which leads to his last claim, that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Son, who has become human to reveal the Father to us. Now, as we consider these mind-bending claims, we then start to hear a story about how John the Baptist first met Jesus and then led other people to meet him and become his disciples. And one by one, as people encounter Jesus, they say out loud who they think he is. And in this one chapter, Jesus is given seven titles. Now, these titles prepare us for John's love of sevens in designing the book, but altogether they also make a claim. 
that this fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the messianic king, he's the teacher of Israel, and he's the son of God who will die for the sins of the world. Now that's a big claim to make about someone, and John will now go on to support it through the stories in chapters 2 through 12. They all have the same basic pattern. Jesus will perform a sign or make a claim about himself, and that will result in misunderstanding or controversy. And so in the end of each story, people are forced to make a choice about who they think Jesus is. The first section shows Jesus encountering four classic Jewish institutions, and in each case, Jesus shows that he is the reality to which that institution pointed. So Jesus is at a wedding party, and the wine runs out, and Jesus then turns these huge jugs of water, like 120 gallons total, into the best wine ever. And the head waiter says to the groom, you've saved the best wine for last, which is, of course, true. But John also calls this miracle Jesus' first sign. In other words, it's a symbol that reveals something about Jesus. So just as Isaiah said that the Messianic kingdom would be like this huge party with lots of good wine, so this first miraculous sign reveals the generosity of Jesus' kingdom. Next, Jesus goes to the Jerusalem temple, the place where heaven and earth were supposed to come together and God would meet with his people. And Jesus asserts his authority over it, running out all the money exchangers, stopping the sacrificial offerings. And when the temple leaders threaten him, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus is claiming that his coming sacrificial death is where heaven and earth will truly meet together. His body that will be killed is the reality to which the temple building points. Then Jesus has this all-night conversation with a rabbi named Nicodemus who thinks that Jesus is just like him, another rabbi and teacher for Israel. But Jesus says that Israel needs much more than just another teacher with new information. Israel needs a new heart and a new life. Or in his words, no one can experience God's kingdom without being born again. Jesus believes that humans are caught in a web of selfishness and sin that leads to death. But he also knows that God loves this world. And so he's here to offer people a new birth, a new chance at life. From here, Jesus travels north, and he ends up at a sacred well in a conversation with a Samaritan, that is a non-Jewish woman. And they start talking about water, which Jesus turns into a metaphor for himself. He says he's here to bring living water that can become a source of eternal life. Now in John, this term refers to a new quality of life, one that's infused with God's eternal love, and it's a life that can begin now and last on into the future. After this, John has designed another collection of stories that took place during four Jewish sacred days, or feasts. And again, Jesus uses the images related to the feasts to make claims about himself. So Jesus first heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath, which starts a controversy with the Jewish leaders about working on the day of rest. And Jesus says it's his father who's working on the Sabbath, and so is he. And they catch his meaning, that he was calling God his father, making himself equal with God, and so they want to kill him. The next story takes place during Passover, the feast that retold the Exodus story with the symbolic meal of the lamb and bread and wine. And Jesus miraculously provides food for a crowd of thousands, which results in people asking him for more bread. And then Jesus goes on to claim that he is the true bread, and if they eat him, they will discover eternal life. And this offends many people who stop following him. After this is a block of stories set in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, which retold the story of Israel's wilderness wanderings as God guided them with the pillar of cloud and fire and provided them water in the desert. And Jesus gets up in the temple courts and he shouts, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And then later he says, I am the light of the world. He's claiming to be the illuminating presence of God and the life-saving gift of God to his people. And some people believe and follow him, but others are offended and still others try to kill him for these exalted claims. The final feast story is during Hanukkah, which means rededication. It's about how Judah Maccabee cleared the temple of idols and set it apart as holy once more. And Jesus goes into the temple area and says that he is the one whom God has set apart as the Holy One, and that he is the true temple where God's presence dwells. And he also says, I and the Father are one. This makes the Jerusalem leaders so angry, they set in motion a plan to kill Jesus, and so he retreats from the city. Now all these conflicts, they culminate in one last miraculous sign. 
Jesus hears that his dear friend Lazarus is sick, but his family lives near Jerusalem, which is now a death trap for Jesus. Now, Jesus could stay away and he would save his own life, but he loves Lazarus. So once he hears that Lazarus has died, he goes to raise him from the dead and he calls him to life out of his tomb, knowing that it will cost him his own life. And the news of this amazing sign, it spreads quickly, of course, and just as Jesus knew it happened, the Jerusalem leaders hear about it and begin conspiring to murder him. And so he rides into Jerusalem as Israel's king who's rejected by its leaders. So the first half of John draws to a close with this story about Jesus laying down his life as an act of love for his friend. And this, of course, is also a sign pointing forward to the cross, which we'll explore more in the next video. But for now, that's the first half of the Gospel of John. The Gospel According to John In the first video, we saw that John wrote this book to make the claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the human embodiment of God's word and glorious presence who has come to reveal who God truly is. Then we explored how John designed the first half of the book to demonstrate this claim. Jesus performed miraculous signs and made huge claims about himself, that he is the reality to which Israel's entire history points. And this all generates controversy, however, and the Jewish leaders confront Jesus for all these claims, and it culminated with Jesus laying down his life for his friend Lazarus. By going near Jerusalem to raise him from the dead, Jesus sealed his fate. And so once the plot to murder Jesus is set in motion, we come into the book's second half. The first part focuses entirely on Jesus' final night and last words to the disciples as he tries to prepare them for his coming death. Jesus performs this shocking act at dinner. He takes on the role of a common servant by kneeling down to wash their dirty feet, something that in their culture a superior rabbi would never do for his disciples. And Jesus says it's a symbol of his entire life purpose to reveal the true nature of God as a being of self-giving love. And it's also a symbol of what Jesus is about to do in becoming a servant and giving up his life to die for the sins of the world. And so this act leads to his great command to his disciples that they are to follow him by loving one another as he has loved them. Acts of loving generosity are to be the hallmark of Jesus' followers. This is what will show the world who Jesus is and therefore who God is. Now from here, Jesus goes into a long flowing speech that's concluded with a prayer. And you'll find the whole thing is unified by a few repeated themes. Jesus keeps saying that he's going away, which makes the disciples sad. But Jesus says it's for the best because it means that he will send the Spirit, also known as the Advocate. As a human, Jesus can only be in one place at a time, but the Spirit can be Jesus' divine, personal presence in any place at any time. And the Spirit will do a number of things, Jesus says. So remember, for John, the unique deity of the one God consists of that loving, unified relationship between the Father and the Son. Jesus says the Spirit is that loving, personal presence that will come to live in his people and draw them into the love between the Father and the Son. And so, Jesus says, his disciples are the ones who abide or remain in that divine love, the way that branches are connected to a vine. He's describing here how the personal love of God can permeate a person's life, healing, transforming, and making them new. And there's more. The Spirit will also empower Jesus' followers to carry on his mission in the world, to first of all fulfill the great command to love others through radical acts of service. But also, Jesus says, the mission is to bear witness to the truth, to expose and name the selfish, sinful ways that we as humans treat each other, and to declare that in Jesus, God has saved the world through him because he loves it. He's opened up a new way to become human again. And so finally, Jesus predicts that there will be opposition. Just as the Jewish leaders rejected him, so his followers will be persecuted. But he tells them not to be afraid because he has already conquered or gained victory over the world. Now, what does Jesus mean by victory here? He doesn't say. But it leads us into the final section of the book where John shows us what victory looks like Jesus style. The Jewish leaders send soldiers to Jesus and his disciples to arrest him. And when the soldiers ask which one Jesus is, he declares, I am. And they fall backward. 
Now, this is brilliant on John's part. These words are the culmination of two sets of seven instances where Jesus has used that very phrase. And it all highlights one of John's core claims about Jesus. The words I am, or in Greek, ego and me, they're the Greek translation of the Hebrew personal covenant name of God that was revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. It was also repeated many times in Isaiah. And John has strategically placed seven moments in his story where Jesus says, I am, followed by some astounding claim. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. And John's also designed seven other stories that have key moments where Jesus says simply, I am, echoing this divine name. And so here, this occurrence, as Jesus is arrested, it's the ironic climax of all of them because Jesus reveals his divine name and power and victory precisely at the moment that he gives up his life. After this, Jesus is put on trial for his exalted claims to be the Son of God and the King of Israel, first before the high priest and then before the Roman governor Pilate, who has to take seriously anyone who's charged with claiming to be the King of Israel. And Jesus tells Pilate that, my kingdom is not from this world, meaning that he is a king and that his kingdom is for this world, but it's radically different value system, it's redefinition of power and greatness. None of this is derived from this world. Rather, they are defined by God's character that Jesus has revealed through his upside down kingdom, which is epitomized by the cross. It's the place where the world's true king conquers sin and evil by letting it conquer him. And Jesus gains victory over the world through an act of self-giving love. After this, Jesus' body is placed in a tomb that is then sealed. And on the first day of the week, Mary and then later the other disciples discover that the tomb is strangely open and then empty. And then Mary, all of a sudden, she meets Jesus. He's alive from the dead. Now, the resurrection of Jesus connects back to another pattern of sevens in John's gospel. So all the way back at the wedding party in Cana, when Jesus turned the water into wine, John told us that that was Jesus' first sign. And he also identified the second sign, the healing of the sick boy in chapter 4. But after this, John just lets you keep count. And if you have, you'll have noticed that the sixth sign was the raising of Lazarus from the tomb, which Jesus performed at the cost of his own life. And so that and all of the signs, they point forward to this seventh and greatest sign at the culmination of the story, Jesus' own resurrection from the dead. It vindicates Jesus' claim to be the Son of God, the author of all life, whose love has conquered death itself. After the empty tomb, Jesus then meets up with all the disciples, and he commissions them by sending the Spirit as he promised, so that his mission from the Father can now be carried on through them. After this, the book concludes with an epilogue that explores the ongoing mission of Jesus' disciples in the world. So a number of them are fishing and they're not catching anything. And so Jesus appears to them on the shore. They don't recognize him though. And he tells them to cast their net on the other side of the boat. And when they obey him, they catch a huge amount of fish and it's only then that they recognize him as Jesus. Now John's offering here a picture of discipleship to Jesus. His followers will be most effective in the world when their focus is not on their work as such, but on simply listening for Jesus' voice and obeying him when he speaks. That's when they will truly see him at work in their lives. After this, Jesus talks with Peter and then commissions him as a unique leader in the Jesus movement, indicating that he too will give up his life one day. But in contrast to Peter, the last moments of the story focus on the author of this gospel, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And unlike Peter, his job was not to lead the Jesus movement, but rather to spend his long life bearing witness to Jesus so that others might believe in him. And that's actually what he's done right here by authoring this amazing story about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's what the Gospel of John is all about. Well now, we've been talking about the Bible as a library made up of many different kinds of books. And there are two facets of the Bible that we need to hold in balance. First of all, there's a variety and secondly, there's a unity.
And the variety is due to the fact that there are 40 different authors in the Bible spread over a period of about 1400 years and writing in three languages and not one of them realized they were writing the Bible, not one. But there's a great variety because the Holy Spirit did not use people as if they were word processors. Do you understand what I'm saying? He used their personality and their different styles. So there's a great variety in Scripture and yet through it all there runs a unity. That's because it had one divine editor. So it had 40 human authors and one divine editor. And that means we've got variety and unity. Now different groups of Christians are afraid of one or the other. Liberal Christians, as we call them, are afraid of the unity of Scripture. They want to be able to pick and choose and set one part against another and tear it to pieces and read the Bible with a pair of scissors in their hand and cut out what doesn't fit in. But evangelical Christians are afraid of the variety. They're afraid of finding contradictions or of inconsistencies. And there are apparent differences that you need to study very closely to resolve. And we are studying together the variety of Scripture. And we're finding that each book is different from every other book. I find that enriches the Bible for me. When you just pick texts out of the Bible, you're treating it as a unity, almost a uniformity as if it's all just one book with one message in one style with one content, but it isn't. It's a library of different books. And so we come to John's Gospel. Of course, the Bible being the Word of God reflects God himself, and in God himself there is variety and unity. The Father and the Son are different from each other, and the Spirit is different from Father and Son, and yet we believe in one God. There's an incredible unity there, even with the variety, and that's reflected in God's Word. There are different personalities writing a scripture, each with their own insight or their own style, and yet somehow the Holy Spirit, the divine editor, has brought a beautiful unity to this whole library. And if you read the first three chapters of the Bible and the last two chapters of the Bible, that's Genesis 1 to 3 and Revelation 21 and 22, you'll be astonished how they hang together. You'd think the same person wrote both and was just tying all, up, all the loose ends up right at the end. Well now the first thing that hits you with John is what a contrast there is to what we call the synoptics. The synoptic, the view together, the first three Gospels all look at Jesus from one side as it were, Matthew, Mark and Luke, all look at Jesus from one side, whereas John seems to be looking from quite a different point of view. So they are synoptic, they're all looking together, but John is looking from another side. I'll take it a little further. These are looking at the outside of Jesus, whereas John is looking at the inside of Jesus. Remember what I said in the last talk on Matthew, that there are three phases of interest in a great man who's lived. The phase number one, their interest is in what he did. Phase number two, in what he said. But phase number three is in what he was. And John belongs to phase three. He's looking at Jesus from the inside. What was he like? What was his real person? Now the contrast can be drawn out specifically in five ways. First of all, John omits a lot of material that there is in the first three Gospels. Now, is he omitting it because it's already been said so well and so frequently, or is he omitting it for a special reason? We shall find it's a special reason. But here is what he's omitted. There's no mention of the conception or birth of Jesus in John. There's no mention of his baptism. There's no mention of his temptations. There's no mention of any casting out of demons. There's no mention of the transfiguration when he took Peter, James and John up the mountain. There's no mention of the Last Supper, of the bread and the wine. There's no mention of Gethsemane and the struggle that Jesus had in Gethsemane. There's no mention of the Ascension. Now, perhaps you never noticed that because when you read the Bible you don't notice what's not there. 
but it's rather important to notice what's not there. Why should he leave all those out? Because they were irrelevant to what he wanted to say. He's telling us something quite different from the other Gospels and there was no point in including all that. There are only seven miracles in John, whereas in the other Gospels there are dozens. There is almost no mention of the kingdom in John. That is a surprise because it's everywhere in the other three. In fact, the word only occurs twice, once when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And the other was to Pilate where he said, my kingdom is not of this world. But apart from that, never mentions the kingdom. Well, that's the first contrast. Now look at the second. Just as there are omissions, there are some very important additions. Of the seven miracles that John mentions, five are completely new. Only two are repetitions. Five are new. They start with water into wine and they finish with the raising of Lazarus. Now why has John made a totally different selection of the miracles? And one clue is that he doesn't call them miracles, he calls them signs. And a sign always points to something beyond itself. And he sees the miracles as very significant. Now you see, the ordinary person is only interested in seeing the miracle. John is interested in saying, what does that miracle point to? And he looks through the miracle, beyond it, to try and understand what it's saying. And so he calls the miracles signs. And he chooses the miracles that are the clearest signs to what he wants to point his readers to. So there are additions. Peter and the foot washing only occurs in the fourth gospel. That's a very important story to him. Uh, as far as the people go, most of the stories about people in John are about individuals. Jesus talking one to one, the woman at the well of Samaria or Nicodemus or whoever, whereas in the other Gospels he's talking to crowds. Great crowds follow him and listen to him, but in John he's talking one to one all the time. Furthermore, there are these seven big statements in John about Jesus himself, I am. I am the bread of heaven, I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, I am the door, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth and the life, I am the true vine. Now how come the other writers miss those? That to me is almost incredible. Such important statements and yet the other three somehow forgot them. It, they just didn't register with the other three writers, but with John, those are among the most important things Jesus ever said because they are signs, pointers to who he was, which is John's interest. Then there is a change of emphasis. The other Gospels, based as they are on the outline of Mark, tend to use his framework of 30 months in the north in Galilee followed by six months in the south. But John is quite different. Almost all of John is in the south and interestingly enough, earlier rather than later. Now again there appears to be a contradiction. Matthew, Mark and Luke say Jesus spent the first 30 months of his life in the north, of his ministry in the north. Yet John is saying, he was in the south at that time. And again, liberal scholars love to point to the fact here's a contradiction, so they can't both be historically accurate. But actually, if you read John carefully, you'll find that Jesus did go south from the beginning, but for the feasts. Like a good Jew, he went up to Jerusalem three times a year. And John concentrates on his visit south rather than what he did in the north during that earlier period. So there's no contradiction. John is highlighting those three visits a year to the Feast of Tabernacles, for example, which none of the others even mentions, but Jesus went up for that feast and said some pretty important things at it. So are you getting the feel of the difference? Let's go to a fourth thing, the style. There are no short parables. 
Instead, Jesus seems to be involved in endless arguments, in long discourses, instead of the simple short stories. And it does seem that when Jesus went south, he changed his style of teaching altogether, largely because in the south he was involved in arguments all the time with the Jews about who he was. Uh, John chapter 8 is a very uh, good example of this, where the Jews say very nastily to Jesus, they say, we know who our Father is, and then they say again, and we are not illegitimate children, we're not bastards. Now that was nasty, wasn't it? But Jesus answered it by saying, I know who my Father is, you don't know him, but I know him. And the whole thing is a discussion, a dialogue, a very hot argument between Jesus and the Jews. Which brings me to a very important point. When we read in John's Gospel that the Jews hated Jesus, that Jesus was always arguing with the Jews, that the Jews crucified him, we make the very big mistake of applying that phrase to the whole nation. And alas, it's caused anti-Semitism for 2,000 years. And it's very sad, the history of Christian attitude to Jews. You killed Jesus. But listen, when John says the Jews, he means the southerners, the Judeans. He does not mean the Galileans. Now, do you understand what I've just said? That's very, very important. John, who was himself a Jew, as was Jesus, as were all the apostles, was not saying we are all involved in this. What he was saying it was the Judeans were the ones that Jesus couldn't get on with. Whenever he went south, he bumped into the Jews, and that simply means Judean. Do you follow me? Very, very important that you realize that John's Gospel is not anti-Semitic. But Jewish people do not like John's Gospel because so many Christians have used it to say, you Jews killed Jesus. But no, many Jews loved Jesus and followed him and started the church for us, so let's be objective in our judgments. The Jews are the people in the south. So there's a difference in style, long discourses, discussion of theology rather than ethics or discussion of what we believe rather than how to behave. There's very little in John about how we're to behave, whereas in Matthew there was a whole lot, but it's about what we believe. And finally, there's a big difference in outlook, and this is a little more difficult to explain. Hebrew and Greek thinking are very different from each other, and I'm going to be mentioning this again and again as we look at different books of the Bible. Trouble is, our Western education is so Greek that we read the Bible with Greek spectacles, and Hebrews are so different. Now, as far as John's Gospel goes, it's a bit of a mixture of the two. And John was writing this in a very Greek world. He was writing it in a town called Ephesus, in western Turkey as it now is. It was Asia Minor then. And it was a mixture of Greek and Hebrew there. And John mixes them a bit from this point of view. The Hebrews worked with a horizontal line of time in their thinking. Past, present and future. The God who was and is and is to come. And all their thinking is on this timeline, and time has purpose and progress. Greeks didn't think like that. They thought on a vertical line of space, above and below, heaven and earth. Now, when you think in Hebrew terms, you're into a line of history, and time is important, and it's traveling in one direction and it's going somewhere and God has decided where it's going. He started off, he'll finish it off. But you're thinking all the time in terms of past, present and future. And the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, are on that sort of timeline. But John, while he doesn't leave it behind because he's Jewish, nevertheless he thinks primarily in his Gospel of the vertical line between heaven and earth, above and below. No man came can go up into heaven except he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. But you see the kind of vertical thinking. 
Jesus is from above and he's come to the below. He's come down. That's, that's the thinking. It's an up and down gospel, whereas the others are a now and then gospel. Do you, you see the difference? Now, John is both, but there's a big emphasis on, I came from above, this other world, and that's very Greek thinking, the other world and this world, that kind of thinking. And so there's a difference in outlook as well. Now let's uh, go a bit further. That's that difference there. The time, the horizontal line is very much Hebrew, present and future, and the key word in that horizontal thinking is age, the present evil age, the age to come, which we looked at in Matthew. But the key word here is heaven and the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to come down from heaven to earth to save us. Vertical thinking. The major emphasis of the Bible is on this, but as we shall see in a number of books, particularly Hebrews, when we get to that, there's a great emphasis on the vertical line, the up and down, and a combination of the two, really. Well, that's the differences. Now let's look at the person who wrote it to get his angle on it, and it's someone very, very special. A fisherman who ran his own retail business selling it as well, as far as we know. He fished in Galilee, but he clearly had connections in Jerusalem, and it's almost certain that he had a retail business for selling the fish in Jerusalem once he'd caught them in Galilee. He certainly was a man of two worlds. He was a man of the north and the south, whereas most of the apostles were northerners. In fact, the only real southerner in the Twelve was Judas of Kerioth, or Judas Iscariot, and he was a misfit anyway, as we know. Jesus found his real support in the north. But John was a bridge between north and south, and he clearly had influential connections down in the south. Now, of the twelve disciples, I don't know if you ever realized that at least five and probably seven were Jesus' own physical relatives. And that's really quite a tribute to Jesus, isn't it, that he managed to get so many of his family, but not of his immediate family. Until after his resurrection, none of his immediate family believed in him. None of his four brothers or his sisters. After the resurrection, they became some of his best missionaries, and two of them wrote part of the New Testament, James and Jude. But before, his immediate brothers and sisters didn't believe, but his cousins did. And it was from his cousins that he got at least five and seven, possibly seven of his twelve apostles. Now, out of those, he had three very close ones, Peter and James and John. And out of those three, he had one special. Now, Jesus didn't have favourites, but he did have these inner circles and this one special. And whenever they sat at a meal, of course, they didn't sit at chairs with their feet out of sight under the table, as we do. They lay sideways and their feet were right next to the face of the next person. That's why you had to have your feet washed before a meal. <laughs> Since we stick our feet under the table, we just wash our hands, but they had to wash feet. But it meant that you were leaning on someone's chest. And literally, the person who leaned on the host's chest was the bosom pal, the bosom friend, the closest. And whenever the disciples sat at a table, John was in that position. And in a very modest way, he doesn't name this, but throughout the Gospel he says, the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is the one, I was the closest. Furthermore, he was not only the closest to Jesus, but he was the last surviving apostle, the last one to know Jesus personally. All the others had been assassinated by the time he wrote this book, so he had to get it down quickly since he was the last. And he'd known Jesus better than any of the others. He'd been in a position to whisper to him time and again. He'd had a private conversation even when they were together with the others. So he had this unique insight. He's now an old man, and at the end of his Gospel he, re he retells the story of how Peter, with typical curiosity, putting his nose into other people's business, asked what was going to happen to John. 
after Jesus had told Peter, you are going to be crucified, Peter. And Peter lived with that knowledge for 30 years. And then dear old Peter says, and what's going to happen to John? <laughs> and Jesus' reply was, mind your own business, Peter. <laughs> he said, if I decide that he will still be around when I return, that's none of your business, Peter. You follow me. And from that day, a rumour went round that Jesus would come back before John died. But that was not what Jesus said, and John says so at the end of his Gospel. That's not what Jesus meant. He was just telling Peter to mind his own business. But John did survive, and maybe that was why Jesus put his mother in John's charge. Always wondered why the brothers and sisters didn't take Mary over. But they were killed for Jesus. And Jesus kept John not just to look after his mother. I think Jesus kept John from assassination because he wanted someone to keep the knowledge alive, that personal knowledge of himself, and ultimately, obviously, led him to write it down. And that's how the Gospel came to us. So he doesn't hesitate to expand Jesus' words. And that's a bit of a problem to some readers. He paraphrases what Jesus said to bring out the full meaning of it. Really believes he knows Jesus' mind so well that he can expand what he said. For example, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You know the verse. Who said that? It's, it's a strange thing for Jesus to say. It's, it's kind of a third person talking about Jesus in a rather indirect way for Jesus to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It's something that someone would say about Jesus, and yet in chapter 3 it's on Jesus' lips apparently. That's the kind of thing you'll find all the way through John. John is expanding what Jesus said because he really understood what it meant, and he draws out the implications, almost putting it into the mouth of Jesus, but he's paraphrasing, he's interpreting for us what Jesus said and the Holy Spirit is guiding him to do so. So I don't have a problem with that. But it does mean that sometimes you're wondering, is this Jesus talking or is it John expanding what he said? It could be either, but it's still the true Word of God and inspired for us. Now we come to the purpose for which he wrote, and that's the real key. And just as Matthew gave us the purpose at the end of his Gospel, about discipling the nations and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. So at the end of John's Gospel, as uh, we had read earlier this morning, we have the reason. The whole world isn't big enough for the books if everything Jesus said and did were written down. But these have been written. In other words, I've selected what I've written. Out of all the material, I've carefully selected these things for this purpose that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Now I'm going to retranslate that for you. I'm sure you know the New Testament was written in Greek, and Greek is not the same as English, and there are peculiar tenses of the verb in Greek. It's such a tragedy that they don't always come out in English. There is one tense of the verb which to me is crucial, and it is called the present continuous tense. And it means to go on doing something. And to translate into English, you've got to add the two little words, go on. For example, Jesus didn't say, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find, knock and it will be open to you. He actually said, go on asking and you'll receive. Go on seeking and you'll find. Go on knocking and it will be open to you. And somebody says to me, you know, I once asked for the Holy Spirit and nothing happened. I say, but Jesus said, go on asking. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking him? And if you really want something, you go on asking, don't you? When our children wanted bicycles, Daddy, can we have bicycles? Then, not yet. A week later, everybody else has a bicycle. <laughs> week later, save bus fares if we had bicycles. They, they go on asking. And in the context of Luke 11 where Jesus said, go on asking for the Holy Spirit, he talked about a neighbour knocking at someone's door and going on knocking until he got them out of bed and got what he wanted. So go on. 
Now then, listen to the verse I've just quoted, properly translated. These are written that you may go on believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And going on believing, you will go on having life. Listen to John 3.16, it'll change it, it may wreck it for you, but listen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever goes on believing will never perish, but go on having eternal life. That changed it for you. It should have done. It's not whoever once believes, it's whoever goes on believing. I'm sure you've heard this of Ephesians 5.18, go on being filled with the Spirit. That's the same tense. The faith that saves you is the faith that goes on believing. The faith you had yesterday won't save you today. Faith you had 20 years ago won't save you tomorrow. Faith is to go on believing. And that's the purpose, and so John was not written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but so that you may go on. It's written for mature Christians to hold them to their faith so that they never depart from their understanding of who Jesus is and will go on believing and therefore go on having life. And eternal life is both a quantity and a quality of life. It's both everlasting and abundant. And it's a quantitative and qualitative adjective is eternal. It's not just to go on living, it's to go on living, really living. The Irish have a greeting, I love the greeting, may you live all the days of your life. <laughs> now that's what Jesus came to do. He came precisely so that we could live all our lives and really live and have life more abundantly. But you only do that as you go on believing doesn't happen if you just believed once 20 years ago. You will enjoy eternal life today if you are believing in Jesus today. And you'll enjoy eternal life tomorrow if you go on believing. And if you go on believing, you will never perish, but go on having eternal life. This is so important because this sort of once saved, always saved thing is such a neat cliche, and it's not to be found in the New Testament incidentally. But people are resting on years ago. When they give their testimony, they can only talk about years ago, you know? And they're, they're resting in a false security. It's my faith today that saves me today. My faith tomorrow that saves me tomorrow. Go on believing and you go on having life. That's why John wrote his Gospel. So let's look at this thing called believing. There are three aspects to faith in John's Gospel and in his letters, incidentally. But we're just looking at uh, John's Gospel now. Now the three aspects, by the way, this verb believing occurs 98 times in this Gospel. That is far, far more than the other three put together. Even Matthew, though I told you faith was a characteristic of Matthew, nearly a hundred times John talks about believing, and it's the verb he uses, not the noun. He rarely talks about faith, he always talks about believing, because believing is something you do. Believing is something active, it's a verb, not a noun. It's not something you have, it's something you do. And so he's always using the verb. But there are three dimensions to believing in John. And unfortunately, many people don't always get the three dimensions. I've given them uh, rather complicated names just for a bit of alliteration, but. Don't worry about that. Alliteration is the province of fools, poets, and Plymouth brethren, I've been told. <laughs> well, I don't know. But let's, let's look at these three words. First of all, credence. That means to believe that something is true. The key word there is that. To believe that Jesus died. To believe that he rose again. It's, it's believing in certain historical facts. It is accepting the credibility of the Gospel, accepting the truth. But of course that's not saving faith, because uh, anybody could say that they believe that something. I know a budgerigar who sings hymns, <coughs> belongs to an old lady in Cardiff and can sing a whole verse of what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> and when visitors come to this old folks home, they hear a little voice saying, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> and they look around 
they look around and here's this budgie in a cage and they push money through the bars of the cage for some reason and the lady who owns it sends the money to a missionary in Africa. Now that budgie is doing more than most church members <laughs> because it is actually praising God every day and it's supporting a missionary in Africa. See, And the old lady has sent 175 pounds already. You see? It's just a budgie guy, it's not a believer. And there are an awful lot of budgie guys in church saying the, you know, saying the creed, saying the creed and yes, I believe that. And the creed is I believe that. But you see, that's only the beginning of faith, to accept the truth. The devil believes the truth too. He accepts it and he trembles, at least he does that about it. He's not a believer. So believing that something is the beginning of faith and accepting the truth, the words and works of Jesus, but then it must move into confidence to believe in someone. How many of you believe in me? <laughs> not a very great response. <laughs> How many of you believe that I exist? There now, you see, word the appeal properly, you get a bigger response. But you see, believing that I exist is one thing, that's credence, you find that credible. But believing in me, I don't even know if those who hesitatingly put up their hands actually do. If you give me all your money to look after, I'll believe it. To believe in someone, you've got to do something to show them you trust them. You follow me? that you have confidence in them and that's to believe in Jesus. Accepting the truth is the first step, doing it by trusting and obeying shows Jesus you trust him. If you do what he tells you, you've got confidence in him. But even that is not enough. There is this third dimension which I've already mentioned which is to go on believing and invariably this verb in John is in this present continuous tense which means to continue believing. In both the Greek and the Hebrew languages, faith and faithfulness are the same word. And you, Sometimes you don't know which it means. In other words, if you really trust someone, you will go on trusting them whatever happens. Do you follow me? If you are really full of faith, then you will be faithful. You'll go on believing in someone whatever happens and whatever it costs. Now that's faith in the Fourth Testament. It's not just accepting the truth and doing the truth, it's holding the truth. And he says, you will really be my disciples if you hold on to what I say and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And holding is a vital dimension of faith because you can make shipwreck of your faith. Many do. They don't hang on there. Hold in. So accepting the truth is credence, doing the truth confidence, holding the truth continuance, going on, being faithful as well as full of faith. And those two words, as I've said, are exactly the same. So we come to this matter of truth. And Pilate in this gospel says to Jesus, what is truth? That's the question that is being asked in our relativistic age today. People are saying, what is truth? Who knows? You've got your opinion, I've got mine. What is truth? The amazing thing is that the answer was standing six feet in front of Pilate. Because truth is not a proposition, truth is a person. That's the great revelation of John's Gospel. People think truth is something it isn't, it's someone. And if you want to know the truth, then you need to have personal knowledge of this person. And therefore the most important question you can ever ask is, what do you think of Jesus? Or as the Jews said to him in chapter 8 here in Jerusalem, they said, who do you think you are? And that's the most important question you can ever ask of Jesus. Well now, inevitably, as people died who knew him personally, rumours and legends began to creep in and speculation came in about Jesus, especially in the city of Ephesus where John, the elderly man, was writing this very gospel. 
I don't know if you are aware that there are many other Gospels that you don't have in your Bible. The Gospel of Thomas is one, a whole lot of them. There are weird stories in those Gospels. There's one Gospel that says Jesus as a little boy was playing in the street in Nazareth and somebody pushed him over into the mud and he pulled himself up and he cursed the boy with leprosy who had pushed him into the mud. Then there's another story about him fashioning little birds out of clay and then blessing them and they flew away. All of this in his childhood. Actually, Jesus didn't do a single miracle until he was 30 because he couldn't do them without the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't do miracles as the Son of God but as the Son of Man filled with the Spirit. And that's why he said, what I'm doing you can do too. So we know these are false. And all these legends and rumours that gather around great people were starting to gather. But in particular there were two things that were beginning to be said which were false about Jesus and John had to write his Gospel to correct them. And I'm not going to tell you what they are, we're going to finish there and next talk we'll start with those two things. Uh, one little correction I've been asked to make on the first talk and I'd gladly make it. I said that uh, the creed is believing that, whereas of course in actual fact it uses the words I believe in. But in fact if you read the creed it's all on that and there's no expression of trust or obedience in the creed. It's believing that but in fact it does use the word in but I'm sure you'll appreciate the difference. It's believing that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate and so on and there's no expression of this in the creed at all so it's not technically believing in and there are plenty of people say the creed who don't trust and obey Jesus. That's the point I was trying to make. Well now let's come on here. In Ephesus two things were happening. First of all there was too high a view of John the Baptist not John the Gospel writer, John the Baptizer or as he was better known, John the Plunger, John the Dipper because uh, Baptizer is simply a nickname and the word means to plunge or to dip or to sink or to soak and he was John the Plunger, John the Sinker. Uh, and there was, we know from Acts 19 that for some reason there was a whole group of people in Ephesus who were followers of John the Baptist and Paul had to correct some of them and say, John told you to believe in the one coming after him. But I'm afraid that John denomination persisted, whether they were called the Johnites or the whatever. We often develop these names, Lutheran, Wesleyan. Don't ever use names like that. We're Christian and that's the only name we want to use among us. But they were followers of John the Baptist and so John set out to write a gospel that would correct too high a view of John. And every time he mentions John, he puts him down. He says John was not the light. He only pointed to the light. He says John did no miracles. And he keeps putting him down. In fact, he says John himself put himself down and said, He must increase and I must decrease. He's the bridegroom, I'm just the best man. And so running through John's Gospel is this correction of too high a view of John the Baptist and he was in a sense trying to kill the denomination that was built around John the Baptist. If you want a modern example of such a group I would talk about the Oxford group or the Moral Rearmament, the MRA as it's known. It's very, very similar to John's ministry of repentance and uh, morality uh, but it uh, I think has lost uh, a Christian dimension. It seeks to clean people up morally but it doesn't have that same emphasis on the Holy Spirit's power and the Lord Jesus' atonement as it maybe had in the early days. Uh, so it's possible for people to have a high moral attitude and to put a stress on repentance and be followers of John. And it was roughly that kind of group that there was in Ephesus. So too high a view of John but much more serious was the fact that in Ephesus they were already holding too low a view of Jesus. Now you see John the Baptist had said two things about Jesus. He will be the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world 
and he will be the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Now we must preach both because if you just talk about taking sins away, you leave people empty and that's very dangerous apart from being miserable. An awful lot of people in the world have had their sins taken away but who've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they can't enjoy the pleasures of sin and they can't enjoy <laughs> the pleasures of heaven either. No wonder they every week call themselves miserable sinners in church because it really, it, it's, it's miserable to be in that position, isn't it? To have all your sins taken away so you can't enjoy them anymore and to be empty and just be a goody-goody and that's not Jesus' intention. He doesn't want to empty your life, he wants to fill it, but he's got to take bad things out of it so he can put the good things in. John the Baptist said, he can do that for you, I can't. I can only wash you in water to get your past clean, but your future I can't do anything about. He's the one who will deal with that. But too low a view of Jesus. Now again, Greek philosophy was having too much of an influence on Christian thinking. The Greeks somehow divided reality into two parts and couldn't get them together. They divided reality into physical and spiritual. We're still suffering from that in the church. Physical things can be spiritual and the Greeks divided the temporal and the eternal. They divided the sacred and the secular. That's the most dangerous one. I will never let a Christian tell me he's in a secular job. I say you're not, you're in full-time Christian service, whatever your job is. But the sacred and secular thing we divide up and because they divided the spiritual from the physical and never got them together, Plato said the spiritual is more real, Aristotle said the physical is more real. He was the first to teach evolution incidentally. But because those two things they could never get together, then they couldn't get it together in Jesus either. Do you follow me? Jesus couldn't be both God and man at the same time because those two things can't ever be one in Greek thinking. Heaven and earth can never get together. Spiritual and physical can't get together. God and man can't be one, not in one person. And so they developed a number of variations. The question is which side of reality was Jesus? Was he divine or human? And some said he, he is more divine than human. And actually he never really was human, he just appeared as a human being. We call this heresy docetism, a word which means phantom. And it's the belief that Jesus was God in phantom form. He just appeared to be human. He wasn't really human. He didn't go to the toilet, for example. Yet Jesus talked about that. And he did empty his bowels and bladder as we have to. You're shocked by my mentioning that. In the book of prayers for Jews, there's a lovely prayer to pray when you go to the loo. <laughs> And it's a prayer that thanks God that your body's working and for the relief it's brought and that you feel better, hallelujah. <laughs> now, I, I've been in toilets, I've been in toilets whose walls are plastered with texts and not one of them is relevant to what I'm engaged in. <laughs> but you see, to Hebrews, to Hebrews, all of life, and I tell you this, when you're old and that part of your body doesn't work, you'll wish you praised God when it was working. But you see, to us it's not spiritual and that's because we're thinking like Greeks, not Hebrews. You see, we can't get the physical and the spiritual into integrated reality and therefore if Jesus was both human and divine, no he can't be, he can't be both. So some said he's more divine than human and only appeared as a human. Others said he's more human than divine. He was a man who perfectly responded to God and developed fully the capacity of the divine that's in all of us. Do you know that's the most common heresy being taught in our theological colleges today? And if you know men like Professor John Hick of Birmingham University who wrote The Myth of God Incarnate, this is what is destroying the faith of young men who go into our theological cemeteries full of faith. And they come out dead and now you know why. It's so very common this that he was the man for others. Have you heard that phrase? being used freely on the BBC. The man, more human than divine, a man who responded to God better than any. We call this adoptionism, that Jesus was only adopted as God's son. It's usually said he was adopted at his baptism, but he wasn't, he was the only begotten. We're the adopted ones. 
So these heresies keep popping up. The third one, he was partly human and partly divine. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses' view of Jesus. Jesus is a demigod, semi-human. He's somewhere in between. Can't be both, but he's somewhere in between, somewhere there. And you check out with your nearest Jehovah's Witness and they can't cope with the first three verses of John's Gospel, so they've changed it in their Bible. We'll come back to that in a moment. That's a very common one today. The truth is, that final one, that actually I think should be an exclamation mark. So don't put a question mark there, that's an exclamation mark. He is fully divine and fully human. He is both. And if he wasn't fully divine and fully human, he could not do for you what you need to have done for you. See, the two things Jesus does for us is he reveals God to us and he reconciles us to God. And he could do neither of those unless he was fully human and fully divine. And that's the truth we must hold on to. It's being eroded and attacked inside the church now on a wide scale. And yet that is the truth that John said, I knew him, I lay on his bosom at meals, I was closer to him than anyone else, I've known him for 63 years. And I know the truth, he was totally human and totally divine. That's the message, that's why he wrote to correct this view of Jesus. And that's why we have in the fourth gospel an emphasis on his full humanity. Jesus is actually more human in the fourth gospel than the other three. There's a greater emphasis on his real humanity. For example, the shortest verse in the Bible is in John's gospel. Do you know it? Jesus wept. And that's almost become a swear word in some circles. You just say Jesus wept when they hit the wrong nail with a hammer, you know? But actually that one verse tells you how human Jesus was. He was standing at the grave of one of his best friends and he wept. He was that human. And it's in John's Gospel that we have this emphasis on Jesus being hungry and thirsty and needing a drink and tired and surprised very human. No wonder that in this Gospel Pilate says, Behold the man. That's a very significant phrase, the man, the man. If you want to know what humanity really is like, then look at this man. And above all, in John's Gospel, Jesus' prayer life comes out. There's more about Jesus praying, which is telling us he was so really human that he had to pray, he had to depend on his Father for what he said and for what he did and for everything. He was so human, he couldn't have survived without that. And some of his most beautiful prayers are in this Gospel, John 17, his prayer for unity. But the main emphasis in John is on his full divinity. While he emphasizes full humanity, this is the thing that was gradually being eroded so that Jesus was slightly less than fully divine and then a bit more less than fully divine and being brought slowly down the ladder. And one of the results of this was to put Jesus on the side of being a creature rather than a creator, which is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They believe that Jesus was the first creature created by God. Now when you put Jesus on the creature side of reality rather than the creator side, you have distorted the truth because he belongs the other side of the line. Again, we'll come back to that. So how does John make his case for the full divinity of Christ? The answer is this magic number seven, which is the perfect number in Hebrew thinking. If you want a perfect round number in Hebrew, it's always seven. It's not in our figuring, but it was in Hebrew thinking. And it, it's probably the most important number in the Bible. And anything that falls short of that is less than perfect. 666 would be less than perfect. Do you understand something there? But 777, now that's something. And we have 777. Three perfect pieces of evidence for Jesus' divinity. 
First of all, seven witnesses. There are seven people called Jesus, the Son of God, in this gospel. John the Baptist does. Nathaniel does. Jesus himself does. Peter does. Martha does. Did you know that she was the first woman to say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? Peter was the first man, but Martha was the first woman. She wasn't just good at Delia Smith recipes, she was also spiritually discerning. And Thomas, and of course John, the beloved apostle. Seven witnesses. Now, in Jewish law, two or three witnesses would be enough, but here are seven. You've got the perfect number of people to testify he is the Son of the living God. Not only do we have seven witnesses, and by the way, the word witness is a vital word. It's used 50 times in the fourth gospel. Witness, 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 witness. What he's saying is we've got personal testimony to this truth. Now the seven works he has chosen very carefully of all the things Jesus did. He singled out only seven miracles. And when you ask why is he singled out these, it's because these are the most supernatural miracles that he did. They're the most sensational. They're the most godlike miracles. Now casting out demons, that's something that plenty of people were doing in the ancient world. Even the Pharisees did that. So that's not godlike. So that's why he has no mention of casting out demons here. But what he has is water into wine. Now, let's see all the psychosomatics do that. See? That's a godlike miracle. See? That's something only God could do. The healing he mentions, the nobleman's son, he singles out that one because that was the one miracle of healing that Jesus did miles from the sick person. He wasn't laying on a hand so that electricity went through his fingers or whatever. And all these psychosomatic healings. Jesus healed the nobleman's son at a distance. He just said, I don't need to come, be healed. And when the man got home at that very minute, he was healed. He said, what time was it when Jesus said that? And he took them. He said, that was the very minute when the child was healed. Now, that's a godlike thing to do, to span the distance. And then the cripple at Bethesda, he'd been there 38 years. That's a pretty chronic condition. You know? Feeding the 5,000, that's the one that uh, all the four Gospels have. That was pretty spectacular. That was created from two sardines and five bread rolls. And he just created in his hands. That's a godlike miracle. That's not your psychosomatic stuff, is it? Walking on water. The blind man blind from birth. From birth. This isn't a condition that has come on. This is a hereditary condition. It's been there all along. And finally, Lazarus. This wasn't the widow of Nain's son who just died that day, or Jairus' daughter who just died. This man was stinking in his grave four days. Now you see, what John is saying is, if you can't see what these are saying, what are they signs of? They're pointing to his divinity. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, no man could do the things you do unless God was with him. See? That's the message of John. Those seven miracles, if we knew no more, would tell you that Jesus was fully divine, that God was with him. And finally, the seven words. Now, you know, Jesus, it was what he said about himself. Jesus was always talking about himself. Do you like people who are always talking about themselves? I don't like them. I want them to talk about me, but they will talk about themselves, you know? <laughs> and they're always beginning, I, I, I've just done this. I've just had a holiday here. I've just bought a new car. I, I, I. Jesus was always talking about himself. But there were seven things he said that were absolutely unique. I am the bread of heaven. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. Now, even we say, I am. You know, who does he think he is? Jesus even once said, I am humble. Now, you just try that at work. 
and see how, see how you get on. And Jesus got away with it. I am humble. But the titles he gave himself, by the way, Jesus has 250 names and titles. Nobody in history has ever had so many. The most names a God has is Allah who has 99 names, but Father isn't one of them and Love isn't one of them, but Jesus has 250 and many of them he gave himself. But the key to it is this I am because in Hebrew that sounds like Yahweh, Yahweh the bread of heaven, Yahweh the light of the world. And they began to say, does he think he's God? Why does he keep using that, that word? And then one day when they said to him, we know who our father is, you don't. Are we right in thinking your father was a Samaritan? That was one of the rumours, you see. And he said, no, I know my father. You don't know yours. They said, we do. Abraham is our father. He, he said, he's not. You, the devil is your father. That's why you're trying to murder me, that's why you tell lies about me because your father is a liar and a murderer from the beginning and when he tells lies he speaks his native language. He said, if you were sons of Abraham you would have the same attitude to me that Abraham had. You would love me, you would listen to me. Abraham was thrilled to see me come and yet you're not, you can't be his sons. And they said, Abraham's been dead 2,000 years and you're not 50 years old. How can you possibly know Abraham? And he said, before Abraham was, Yahweh, I am. And that, of course, was at his trial what finished the case. They couldn't get two or three witnesses to agree on what Jesus had actually said, but the judge finally incriminated him from his own mouth, which is illegal. And he swore him to speak. He said, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us who you are. Are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? And Jesus said, Yahweh. And the high priest rent his clothes and said, how many witnesses have we now? Seventy. You all heard it. And it was on that ground that he was condemned to die. Well now, that, those seven words are scattered through John's Gospel and are crucial to his case. The other synoptics miss them all. But you see, John's interest in Jesus was in who he was, not in what he did or what he said. And therefore he noticed those and he stored them up in his memory and he wrote them down for us. Well now that's his testimony to Jesus. And then he does something beautiful. When Mark wrote his account of Jesus, he said, I'm going to begin when Jesus was 30 years of age because that's when he sprang into public view. Matthew wrote the next gospel to be written. He said, no, you've got to go further back than that. You've got to go back to his birth, his conception, and because he was a Jew, you must go back to Abraham. I'm going to start the story of Jesus with Abraham. Luke came along third and he said, no, he said, Jesus was the man, he was a human being, he, he belongs to the whole human race, I'm going to start with Adam. That's where you start the story of Jesus, with Adam. John came along, he said, you're all three wrong. He said, I'm going to start at the beginning. <laughs> and he took the words from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, and he said, in the beginning, he was already there. The word already was. And so we come to this intriguing question. What do you call Jesus before he was born? See, we're so used to calling him Jesus that we forget that that was a brand new name given at the moment when he became man. But he wasn't called that before. God never called him Jesus. So what was he before? And when John wrote his Gospel and began at the beginning, or as far back as human thinking can go, which is to the beginning of our universe, we can't imagine before that, so you can't even say anything before that. So he went right back to the beginning of history and he said, at the very beginning he was already there, but what do we call him? And then comes this unique name to John's Gospel, the Logos, L-O-G-O-S. Now that is an amazing title. It's not used by anyone else in the whole Bible of the Son of God. And yet John carefully used it. Why? What does it mean? Again, it's a bit unfortunate that in most of our Bibles it's simply translated the Word. 
but at least they've got in the definite article the. It's, Jesus wasn't just a word, but the word. But there's more to it than that, much more. What is a word? You know, I'm sure some of you will be saying to me over lunch or sometime, could I just have a word? Well, if that's all you want, I'll just say logos and we'll leave it there. <laughs> you see, what, what's a word? What's a word? It's, a word is simply an express thought that comes out of my mouth and into your ear. Is Jesus just something that came out of God's mouth into our ear? No, he's much, much more than that. This word has a history. You remember I told you John lived and died ultimately in a place called Ephesus in western Turkey? Well, that's very significant because in Ephesus, 600 years before John was writing this, in 568 BC, there lived a man in Ephesus called Heraclitus. H-E-R-A-C-L-I-T-U-S. And Heraclitus was the founder of science. And Heraclitus was a keen observer and he never grew out of his little boy's habit of asking why. Now little children are always saying, why daddy? Why mummy? Why? Why? Till you get tired of it. But I hope you never grow out of that. Don't think I have. I keep asking why. Why was this book written? Why, why is this said? Why, why, why? Now Heraclitus was like that and he said, what you need to do is to train your senses of sight and hearing and touch to observe what's going on around you and then you must ask, why does that behave the way it behaves? You must ask it of the weather and the clouds. You must ask it about the animals. You must ask it about human beings. Why? Do they behave like that? And he coined this phrase, the reason why, only he didn't speak English. He called it the Logos. And he said the Logos is the reason why. He said you must always try and look for the Logos in anything. So when you study life, bios, look for the Logos in bios, look for the biologos, look for biology. When you study the weather, look for meteorologos, meteorology. You know Maureen Lipman's British Telecom advertisement? To her nephew, she says, so you got an ology. <laughs> He's got a degree in something, you see. And every branch of science is looking for the logos, the reason why things are as they are. You follow me? So when you study how the human psyche behaves, you call it psyche logos, psychology. When you look at how society behaves, you call it sociologos, sociology. Every branch of science is based on Heraclitus logos, the reason why. But of course the snag with science is it only looks at a tiny part of reality. It looks at bios or animals, zoos or psyche or socio, whatever. And you only find out the reason why in a very small part of reality. And in fact, it's so specialized now that scientists know more and more about less and less. And they're finding the Logos in an ever-narrowing field that develops its own jargon and language, which cuts them off from everybody else. But you see, John is saying you've got to ask about the reason why behind the whole lot. What's the reason why it's all here? The answer is Jesus. Isn't that exciting? Again, you can whisper hallelujah if you like. <laughs> but you see, all this was made as a present from God to his Son, and it's all for Jesus. That's the reason why we're here. It's all going to be summed up in him. He's the reason why. He's the Logos. I find that an exciting concept. You may know the reason why computers behave as they do, or the reason why animals behave as they do. See, David Attenborough knows so much about the reason why in nature, but he doesn't know the reason why it's all there. See? But we do. And the reason why is Jesus. Isn't that exciting? He's the Logos. But that word had another phase in its history. It crossed the Mediterranean Sea and it went to Alexandria, which was a centre, a university town, which combined Greek and Hebrew thinking because there were many dispersed Jews living in Alexandria and in the university, many professors, and one in particular, a professor of philosophy called Philo, P-H-I-L-O. 
And it was in that university they translated the Old Testament into Greek. Seventy scholars in that university did it together and so it's called the Septuagint or sometimes it's called the LXX <coughs> because of those 70 scholars in the University of Alexandria who translated. So they were seeking to interpret Hebrew thinking into Greek and Philo, Professor Philo, seized on this word logos and he said the logos, we should not talk about it but he. Now he didn't mean the logos was a person, he was personifying it. That's all. But he said it's more than a thing. The reason why is more than a thing, we can personify it. Now personifying a thing is when you talk about your car as she. Yeah? Oh, she's really running well today. Now you didn't think your car was female, did you? No. I mean you might have been driving a male van, for example, but... Uh, <laughs> all right. But you see, to, to, I'm just seeing if you're awake. Uh, to personify, to personify something, we gave our first car a name. It was a little um, Austin 7, 1928. It was a pram on wheels, you know, with a lawnmower engine. And we called it Dorcas because she was full of good works. <laughs> and uh, we were personifying it, you see. We weren't kidding ourselves it was a person, but we had given it a character. And it was no longer an it. Now, you see, that's what Philo did with Logos. He said, it's not an it. Wisdom is personified in Hebrew thinking as, as a woman. Seek her. She is the woman you need, wisdom. Seek her in the streets and so on. Uh, Book of Proverbs does that. But Logos was personified in a male form. He runs she. And so John was able to take the reason why of Heraclitus and the personified he of Philo and say, I can take that word one step further. His name is Jesus. See how the word came together? And uh, it's a very exciting word. Uh, before we finish this, maybe I'll read just a little of John's Gospel to you. What John says in the first page of his Gospel, he says four absolutely vital things about the Logos. Number one, his eternity. In the beginning, the Logos was already there. Second, his personality, the second statement he makes is, and the Logos was face to face with God. That's the literal translation. It's the word you use of two people who are just looking into each other's eyes and loving each other. Face to face, a relationship. Do you realise that we're the only people on earth who can say God is love? Because we're the only people who believe that God is three in one. If God was only one person, as the Jews and the Muslims believe, you can't say he is love, because love is impossible for one person. But if God is more than one person, if he's Father and Son loving each other, you can say he is love and always was love. See the importance of this? So the Logos was eternal, the Logos is also personal. Not an it, but a full he. Thirdly, the deity and the Logos was God. In the beginning the Logos was already there and the Logos was face to face with God in a personal relationship and the Logos was God and that's where the Jehovah's Witnesses get stuck. And that's the phrase they change in their Bible, to the Logos was a God. That makes all the difference. The Logos was God, fully divine. And then comes this incredible false statement, and the Logos became flesh and pitched his tent among us. And we beheld his glory, glory such as you would only see in the only begotten Son of the Father. Now that's a tremendous opening. That's why I don't give John's Gospel to unbelievers. What unbeliever can begin to understand that? I hope that you're understanding it better now than you did before you came here. Well now let's just look at this matter of life, believing in him, the Logos, as the Son of God and going on believing in him, you will go on having life. And John draws a series of contrasts as to what that will mean for you. You will know life rather than death. In fact, you won't see death. That life will just continue through because death can't touch it. It's a life of life, not a life of death. Everybody else, every beat of their heart is a drumbeat 
on their march to the grave. But we're living life, not death. We will not walk in darkness. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the darkness there is moral darkness. You walk with me and you won't be in things that you have to hide. You walk in the light. Everything above board, no secrets, everything out in the light. You will be living a life of truth and not lies. That's another contrast that comes all the way through John's Gospel. It's truth, reality. And the word true and the word real are the same in the Hebrew and the Greek. So truth and reality are the same. You'll be living in reality. You'll be living in freedom. Oh, I think I've got that wrong way round, haven't I? Turn those round. You'll be living in freedom, not slavery. And the Jews said to Jesus, we've never been slaves of anyone. How can you claim to set us free? Well, what short memories they had. <laughs> never been slaves of anyone. Had they forgotten about Egypt? Did they not still celebrate Passover every year? Yet they thought they were free. And Jesus said, whoever sins is a slave to sin. Because every time you sin, you help to strengthen a chain of habit that will be your master. And I've come to set you free. So what a life we're living, a life of life, a life of light, a life of truth, a life of freedom. And above all, there's a contrast between love and wrath. You either live in God's love or you live under his wrath. And with all the consequences that brings. So what is life? Sorry, what is life? Life is to know, personally know, the Father and the Son whom he has sent. But you'll get to know the Father through the Son. Now, just a minute. How can we possibly live this kind of life? That's beyond us. Well, the answer is that no gospel tells you as much about the Holy Spirit as John's gospel does. And it's through the Holy Spirit that you enjoy this life. And John knew this. And so if you go quickly through John's Gospel in chapter 1, he says Jesus will, will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and will be the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Chapter 3, he talks about being born of the Spirit, born again, born out of water and Spirit. The two baptisms we need, water and Spirit, born out of that, we enter the kingdom. Chapter 4, he talks about living water and worship in spirit and in truth. Chapter 7, he goes to the Feast of Tabernacles and on the last day of Tabernacles, they prayed for rain because every year they've had six months with not a drop of rain. And in September, October, they want to see the early rains come back. So on the last day of the feast, they fill up a great pitcher with water at the pool of Siloam, Siloam, and they carry it up to the temple and pour it on the altar and pray for rain. And when they did that on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and I will give him springs of living water, springs gushing up in his innermost being. He was speaking about the Holy Spirit. Chapters 14 to 16 are full of the new comforter that's going to come, the spirit of truth, the paraclete. That's the Greek word. It means para, beside, kletos, called. The one who stands by you, the one who's called alongside you, the one who'll stand by you, the one who'll comfort you, make you into a fortress. Another comforter just like Jesus. And finally, chapter 10, he prepared them for Pentecost by giving them a sign and a command. The sign he blew on each of them. He went round, and then he said, now receive the Holy Spirit. They didn't receive anything at that moment. It was a rehearsal for Pentecost. If that were the moment when they received, he'd have blown on them after he commanded them to receive, but he didn't. He blew on them, then he said, now receive. And the next thing they knew, a few weeks later, they were seated in the temple and they heard, <laughs> it's Jesus blowing on us. Now let us receive. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and lived this eternal life, this abundant life which Jesus came to bring.